thank you for coming out on this kind of chilly evening um, to talk about climate change. <laughs> it's all extremes. I love the people that say, well, it's cold today. There can't be any global warming. So here we have a really uh, interesting and important speaker coming to talk to us about an aspect of, of uh, climate change or global warming, as I prefer to call it, um, that maybe hasn't received as much attention as environment, environmental impacts of climate change, and that is economic in, impacts of climate change. And in terms of effecting change in our society, this is probably an extraordinarily important aspect that people have to be made aware of. And if you saw the business section in the Sunday New York Times, when do you, when do you expect to see the entire front page of the business section devoted to climate change? So this tells you that people like Mark Shapiro and others who are bringing attention to the economic impacts of climate change, how it's going to impact business, are um, making a lot of noise and getting a lot of deserved attention. So um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Judy Storch. I'm one of the campus deans for the Cook, for the Cook Campus, one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event. Uh, the main sponsor is the Rutgers Climate Institute. And, um, but importantly, we have a number of uh, graduate student groups and undergraduate student groups that are also sponsoring this event. And I really want to uh, commend the student body at Rutgers for taking on this issue so forcefully and importantly. And so our student sponsors are the Environmental Sciences Graduate Student Association, the Oceanography Graduate Student Association, the uh, Students for Environmental Awareness, Thank you. <laughs> and the Rutgers Fossil Fuel Divest Movement. So um, after, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be the one that's introducing our speaker tonight. We have uh, Professor Robin Leschenko, who is a professor in the geography department at the School of Arts and Sciences. And Robin is uh, an expert in the economic impacts of um, and human dimensions of global climate change. And so this is very much, the topic of tonight's uh, talk is very much in, within her area of, expert, of expertise. She has served on national panels that evaluate programs involved in, uh, in uh, climate change. And she is the editor of a journal named Urban Climate. So. Uh, if you'll help me welcome Robin, and I, one other thing I want to mention is that after uh, Mark Shapiro is finished talking tonight, there'll be a book, he's, he's going to be talking about stuff in his book on climate shock, and you can buy the book and get it signed after the, after the talk. So please welcome Dr. Robin Lachenko to introduce Mark Shapiro. Thanks everyone for coming out. I know it's always you know, a little bit of an extra effort to come out to things on s school nights, though I call them. Um, so I, I really appreciate the turnout. Um, and I also want to reiterate our thanks, not just to um, the, you know, our, our main organizers, but for, for all the students who helped and all the volunteers sitting out and signing people in and really kind of making these events, making these events possible. So um, I'm the, I'm, in addition to being a professor in geography, I'm also the co-director of the Rutgers Climate Institute. And um, this is our second major sort of you know, journalist type speaker that we've brought in this year. And um, so it's really a, it's really a pleasure. We, these seem to be really um, popular events and events that seem to really reach a wide audience. So I'm very appreciative of the work that goes in and also ha having such a good audience. Um, but let me just give a quick introduction for Mark. He is an investigative journalist whose work looks at the intersections between environment, economics, and international political power. Um, he's had writings that have appeared in many major magazines and newspapers, magazines including, the Harp, including Harper's, The Atlantic, Yale 360, The Nation, and a number of other publications. And his most recent book, which we're going to be hearing about tonight, and I also have a copy, Carbon Shock, um, is, a, is a book really focusing on 
as we'll hear, the economic, many of the economic dimensions of climate change, and many of the dimensions that I think are kind of surprising and unexpected, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say any more because that's what we're going to be hearing about, but I think it'll be, you'll defi you're definitely going to hear some things tonight that you probably haven't heard before and that you probably haven't even thought about before. Um, he's also written another book called Exposed, the Toxic Chemistry of Everyday, Pod Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. And in addition to all of this, all of this you know, you know, excellent journalism and excellent books, he's won, as a result, he's won numerous awards, including a Society of Professional Journalists, Sigma Delta Chi Award, a DuPont Award, the Society of Environmental Journalists Reporting Award, a National Magazine Award, and a Kurt Shork Award for International Reporting. Wow, that's a long list of awards. Mark's also an adjunct professor currently at Middlebury Institute of International Studies at, at Monterey, and he's also a lecturer at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. So without further ado, let me welcome our speaker. Okay, great. Good to be here. Get a little bit of water. I, um, it's my first time really to Rutgers. It's been a really interesting day actually to figure out what your Climate Institute is trying to do and bring all these people together from different disciplines. You have like scientists meeting sort of environmental accountants, meeting physicists and astronomers, and I actually think that that's where the um, action is when it comes to climate change, which is ultimately the most interdisciplinary field you could possibly come up with, which is one why it's so, it's so urgent of our time. It's also endlessly fascinating to actually try to comprehend and grasp and study the various aspects of climate change. And I uh, certainly approached this um, topic that way as a journalist in trying to understand the multiple levels at which we can understand climate change. So I, um, like Robin said, I actually set out several years ago to, whoops, uh, um, is that okay? To document the economic, it might be these two feeding off each other. Yeah. Um, to document the economic implications of uh, climate change, which I felt had not been just totally understood. It's very gratifying to see things like it this idea coming out in the Sunday New York Times and elsewhere, because I think it's obviously something being picked up on. Uh, I started writing this book a couple of years ago, and now it just came out a couple of months ago. Um, to actually get at the heart of that issue, um, I want to actually tell you a story about a rock. And for those of you, hopefully, you can tell what I'm holding here. I'm holding a rock, a very simple rock. It's not any more complicated. It's spelled R-O-C-K. And uh, the only difference, <laughs> I don't even want to see them so much. Um, the only difference between this rock and the rock that you might have in your front yard it's about the size of my fist, and it happens to be coated with oil. This rock is coated with black oil that I took from a beach in northwest Spain in the province of Galicia. I don't know if anybody here knows about Spain, northwest coast of Spain, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a uh, torrential uh, winter night in November 2002. The waves were crashing at like 30-foot waves along the Costa del Muerte off the coast of northwest Spain. Where is that? That's right where Spain, you know, the bend of Spain where you go, ar you go around from Ireland and then you turn around the corner from Spain, you start heading south towards Ireland. That opening to the North Atlantic is known in Spanish as the Costa del Muerte. It's where a lot of Spanish galleons sank. And if you feel like diving, you know, 2,000 feet to the bottom, you could probably find some Spanish gold down there. But one uh, evening in November 2002, a uh, single hull uh, oil tanker coming by the uh, northwest coast of Spain, there off the coast of Galicia, uh, caught up in a massive 
winter storm where the kind of waves were crashing at 30 feet high, treating the boats there like a toy. They all looked like toy boats going to people who were there. And in the middle of this storm came the Prestige oil tanker. It's called the Prestige. And that oil tanker broke in half. And up from the hull of that tanker, what's that? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. How's that? OK. <laughs> Maybe we just need to turn this thing off. So can people hear me now? You got the oil tank, you got the ocean, you got, you're like massive, you're getting seasick. It's like an enormous uh, winter storm that's happening off the northwest coast of Spain. And in the middle of this storm, this is in November 2002, the tanker, oil tanker, sinks. Out from its belly come 39,000 tons of oil. Comes washing onto the coast of Spain. Ultimately covers about 1,000 miles all the way up to the coast of France. Comes the oil from the belly of this uh, oil tanker. And I went to the coast of Spain at that time to do a story on this oil tanker and what set it off to sea and why it sank and, and what the backstory was of this tanker. I did a story for a television show called Frontline, called Frontline World. And uh, I was interested in what brought that tanker out to the, at that evening. And so I went on to the beaches, and I looked at where, the, where this oil ended up, and I stood out on these remote beaches. These are not the kind of beaches you go to in Atlantic City or the types of beaches you, anybody goes to in a bathing suit or a bikini or anything. This is like rugged, rocky, windy, cold, freezing, isolated North Atlantic beaches, which that day, I will never remember, six months after the spill, in every direction were coated with this black gunk of oil that came from the prestige. And out there in the middle of absolute nowhere, in the North Atlantic, it smelled like a gasoline station. And I've never forgotten that experience. And so at that time, and this was about 10 years ago, I took this rock. I took this rock off the beach and I put it in my pocket because I never wanted to forget that sensation of what it meant to have oil defiling the landscape in this kind of way. And I never quite knew what I would do with this rock. I just knew I wanted to remember it. It was my talisman of that experience. Because I'll also never forget looking at all the volunteers who sat there hopelessly scratching at the boulders trying to get the oil off of the, off of the, off of the rock. And um, when I started looking into climate change, which happened several years later, I, wrote, I did a couple stories on this kind of oil disaster, I realized that this rock, this experience, on the coast of Spain was a symbol. This is a representative of climate change. It's so difficult to actually visualize what climate change actually means. Are, are greenhouse gases visible? No. For the most part, you actually can't see greenhouse gases. These are not the kind of gases that uh, cause acute pollution, that cause asthma, and et cetera, et cetera. These gases are, for the most part, invisible. The action that happens up in the atmosphere, largely invisible. We don't even know how to really comprehend it. And so when you think of climate change, I wanted you to think about this rock and the oil that remains on this rock 10 years later. And it sat above my desk now for 10 years to remind me what this whole story is all about. Because what else does this rock tell us about climate change, about the essential qualities of climate change? Number one, the, uh, the, uh, the oil. <laughs> the oil, that was perfect. Uh, the, um, the oil that came from that uh, tanker actually came from everywhere, came from nowhere. The oil was, uh, was actually owned by a Russian oligarch. The uh, ship was owned by uh, Greek oligarchs, <laughs> who were a rich uh, Greek uh, shipping, ship owning uh, family. The ship itself was, uh, was uh, flying the flag of the Bahamas. As you know, ships basically can buy flags from anywhere and they put their flag up and it means nothing in terms of the regulation running the flag of the Bahamas, and it was registered in, uh, guess where it was registered? In the big, thriving metropolis, sorry? Thank you, <laughs> this gentleman knows. In the uh, country of Liberia, which has one of the most sophisticated uh, environmental monitoring system on the face of the earth, as you probably know. So uh, it turns out that two-thirds of the oil tankers on the ocean today are registered in Liberia. Why is that important? Number one, 
because another thing about climate change is um, years, 10 years have gone by, 10 years have gone by, the amount of devastation on that coast in Spain was, you know, built, the, the, the marine ecology was devastated, the tourist economy was devastated, nobody could sell fish out of that area any longer. It's a rich, uh, used to be a rich uh, fishing zone. Uh, billions and billions and billions of euros spent to clean up those beaches. Um, and uh, who had to pay for it? Did the owners of the ship pay for it? No, because the owners of the ship had registered it in Liberia, and, and, and therefore there was no mechanism. And they, of course, they had a one-ship company. This is, uh, they, 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 owned one, they, they registered one, one ship with one company in Liberia, and where was the ship at the bottom of the ocean? So with this trick of accounting, uh, nobody was ever held responsible for the damages. Six billion euros is about $10 billion uh, caused by that one ship traveling across that one area in northwest Spain. Does that remind you of something? That we Climate change. What happened to the cost to the, uh, to, for the cleanup of those beaches in uh, Spain? What's that? Social cost. The people of, uh, of, of Spain and the people of Europe, in this case, um, had to actually had to pick up those ships, not the owners of the oil. So somebody pays for those costs, and this is what I want to talk about when it comes to climate change, because this rock is representative of the fundamental question of climate change, is who pays for the costs of fossil fuels? And this is known in, um, in, uh, in economic terms as, and those of you who study environmental, envir environmental studies will know it as externalized costs. Those who study the economists, this is such a common phenomenon that the economists even come up with a term for it. They call it externalized costs. What does externalized costs actually mean? It means we buy a good, but we don't pay the actual cost for that good. The company makes the profit on the good, and we bear the risk in terms of the financial risk. The externalized cost means that we, the public, the society, pay for the cost of a particular, the consequences of our use of a, of a particular good. And so, I'd like to think of, uh, one way to think of climate change is that we are unleashing an oil spill like that a day into the atmosphere. What's the only difference between the oil that came out of the belly of that prestige and the oil that I put in my 14-year-old Saab in uh, California, or you put in your own whatever car you drive here in uh, New Jersey? The only difference is that this oil uh, didn't take a little diversionary run through my gas tank to run a car. It ended up straight on the, oil, on, the, on the beaches of Spain and then sort of contaminated the atmosphere. That's the only difference between the oil on this rock. So um, we're unleashing a spill every day along those lines into the atmosphere is one way to think about climate change. And so my book, I set off essentially to, um, to actually identify and begin to understand what the consequences are and what the costs are of climate change in a way that we haven't understood before. Why? Because those goods are, uh, because those costs are hidden. They're not identified as climate costs. We call them something else. And what do we call them? Well, um, I give you one word for it. What's that? Sorry? They can't hear? Oh, Jesus, some blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> How's that? Woo, okay, yay. Okay, great, sorry about that, Jesus. So, sorry if you missed anything. <laughs> Did anybody, was there people basically able to hear? Yeah, okay, good. So, um, so what do we call the cost of climate change? I set off in, uh, in, 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 in writing this book to actually begin to understand the economic consequences of climate change because I think that that is a huge part of this whole picture that we have not understood. And we are, the economy that we're operating under right now creates a false sense that fossil fuels are less expensive than renewables. 
It's fundamental to actually understand what the actual costs are of fossil fuels in order for, as a society, to move forward and make some educated decisions as to what the, based on the actual costs of fossil fuels, what are the real costs that the society pays, meaning society is like us, you and me and every other taxpayer out there, paying um, for the cost of fossil fuels. So I'll just give you a couple of, uh, of, 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 of quick examples. The, um, the, there's an environmental accounting firm which I recommend those of you studying this issue to be aware of. You don't already called True Cost, which is a British accounting firm. There's a lot of environmental accounting. And they did a study for the United Nations where they concluded that, um, that the 3,000 biggest companies in the world, this is not very many companies, 3,000 of the biggest companies in the world cause um, $2.1 trillion uh, in uh, annual environmental costs, meaning the amount of costs that are not reflected in the cost of the good that they produce. And uh, most of those costs are related to climate change. What do those costs look like in this country? What are the names they go under in this country? They go under a different name. What are the names they go under in this country? Thank you. Well, we've got Superstorm. You guys experienced Superstorm Sandy. Everybody knows that climate change did not, does not cause storms. We all know that. That's completely clear. But, it, but what we also know is that climate change uh, dramatically intensifies the impact, the breadth, the depth, the intensity by which storms strike and their duration. That is absolutely clear. And so a significant portion of Sandy can be attributed to climate change. So when we talk about the cost of climate change, we should say Sandy. We should also say what else? What? Drought, thank you. Yes, I was going to get to drought. Yes, drought. What is the, um, the government program, one of the government programs which the government of the United States itself uh, says is on the brink of fiscal peril in terms of its uh, integrity right now? Almost. Almost. Flood insurance, actually, that's half right. Crop flood insurance is correct. It's actually one. Uh, the one I was thinking of, which I think may be a little more surprising, is uh, crop insurance. So what's happened over the last five years in the food systems of the, um, of the United States? Well, what you've had is droughts, massive droughts in the Midwest and in California where I live. I came out here to New York, I was like, oh, wow, well, nobody cares about how much water they use. It's totally different in California where some cities are actually starting to have rationing of water. So remember that if you come to California. Um, Massive drought across the uh, Midwestern food growing areas. Uh, massive drought across the California uh, food growing areas. Um, so who pays for that? We do, we do thank you. Uh, the public, we have a th system here called crop insurance, which of course is a federally subsidized uh, program of crop insurance. The payments related to climate related phenomenon have skyrocketed over the last 10 years largely due to the inadequate water supplies and the, um, and the extraordinary heat. So um, I'll give you an example of the, um, of the impact. So, and, and this, by the way, I write about this in my book of this report that came out which describes the kind of perilous state of the crop insurance system because of this situation. I went up and down the uh, central, California, central Valley in California. It was actually amazing to um, see the um, impact of climate change on one of the central food growing areas of this country. If you're growing, if you're eating kind of uh, nuts or berries or um, some tree crops here in New Jersey, they very probably come from the Central Valley in California. And you drive up and down this area, as I did several times, and talk to farmers about the conditions that they're facing. What's really amazing is, number one, uh, many farmers are essentially these are large farms in the Central Valley, some of the breadbasket of the United States of America. They export to this part of the country as well as all over the world. And uh, massive tree farms of almonds and peaches and cherries and um, oranges, and it's a huge abundance. And uh, one after another, the farmers I would go visit who were just these kind of mainstream farmers, they weren't organic, they were conventional farmers. And I'd go like, well, what's going on here? And they would say, um, they would say, I don't know. You know, it's, the weather here has been like any other time. My father, my grandfather, um, and um, 
What's interesting is, as you probably have guessed, in California, maybe the same as in New Jersey, farmers are fairly conservative politically. The word climate change tends to scare a lot of people off because they think that means regulation. So, uh, but what was interesting over and over again is they would say something like, essentially, um, I don't know if it's climate change, whatever, whatever you, you know, down here from wherever want to call it, you can call it whatever you want, but things are changing out here. It's getting, the weather's getting weird, the water's not falling as it used to, and over and over again. So what does that mean? That means actually that the yields of crops have been steadily declining, which means that, um, that, uh, that the price for food is rising, and the price for insurance is rising. And if you look, actually what's interesting is we have in California the cherries. I don't know if you uh, enjoy, I don't know if you grow cherries here. I know you have a tree crop, um, uh, tree crops here in New Jersey. I know in California we have a lot of cherries, center of cherry production. And you go into these areas and they're just beautiful with all these beautiful white blossoms. And you know, this is cherry country. Go down to Washington, D.C., see a lot of cool cherry trees and stuff. We have that in the Central Valley in California. And it's been a tradition every May to basically go down there and get these big baskets of cherries with the little white blossoms and everything. Well, what's happened over the last uh, five to 10 years is more and more of those cherry trees are getting distorted. So you go out there, and I went out with some farmers, including the guy who's the head of the cherry advisory board. He's not some radical environmentalist. He's been growing cherries for three generations. And he shows me, he says, see those blossoms up at the top of the tree? Well, those blossoms, that's, that's what you see, and it looks beautiful when you drive by, and it's a lovely sight. He said, but look at the middle of the tree. Look at the bottom third of the tree. And you can see the middle of the tree with these half-formed blossoms coming out, just trying, struggling to get out. And then you saw the bottom third of the tree where there were no blossoms whatsoever. And he said, that is the effect of what's called the, um, the, low, the lack of a low chill. Right, because uh, tree crops, or agricultural people here probably know this better than I do even, but tree crops need a period of cold in order to come out and ripen several months later, every December. They're supposed to get cold so they can kind of almost hibernate, preserve their resources, and in March they come out explosively with all their beautiful blossoms and fruits. Well, that cold has been dramatically reduced by around a quarter in the uh, northern part of the San Joaquin Valley, which is lead leading to distorted um, um, cherries, even those double cherries, which sometimes you get as a sign of kind of extreme climate stress. And so the yields have been dropping of cherries, the price is going up. And um, so I think the way to understand climate change is at every step of the way, you've got these costs that are beginning to creep upon us and they're beginning to help, uh, hit people at every stage. And um, um, so I like to think of this, there was kind of a incredible, uh, there, there's an incredible, um, installation in the Copenhagen uh, climate negotiation, which I happen to go to, and which probably you're learning about in your classes as somewhat of a failed endeavor, although I hesitate to say failed because there were a few things that did happen. But broadly speaking, it was not a raging success. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, uh, what's interesting is the, um, is the, um, is the Danish uh, energy agency implant is freezing. It was December. It was colder even than here. And um, in this kind of freezing, icy, bone chilling atmosphere, they'd, uh, the Danish energy agency had created a kind of an installation of a huge balloon that was about one square block uh, wide, one square block in uh, area. And this enormous balloon had across it the words, huge words emblazoned, one ton of CO2. So this was basically the size, the volume of one ton of CO2, right? Because how do you see CO2? We can't see it usually. So they helpfully provided us an enormous balloon to understand what the size and the volume is of the CO2 we're sending into the atmosphere. So we send up about 50 billion tons of CO2. I think it was last year, about 50 billion tons. So I like to actually try to understand um, climate change is by imagining, take that balloon and imagine it full of money. That's what we're doing. We're sending up 50 billion balloons packed with money. And who benefits from that particular equation? The fossil fuel companies. Because we, the public, and when I should be more specific in terms of money, the money, the money that's in those balloons is the public's money, is the public's resource, is part of our common shared uh, resources. 
And so the fundamental challenge of this international community and our own country and this state and every one of us is to begin to find a, uh, a, 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 a mechanism for assigning the proper price for uh, carbon, for greenhouse gases, we call it for shorthand, we call it carbon, which is why I call this book Carbon Shock, um, and um, is to find a uh, mechanism for assigning a price to carbon that is, actually reflects its cost to society. And when we do that, I think it's actually really important, number one, when you actually look at the negotiations that just concluded in Lima, when you look at the negotiations upcoming in Paris, this is the fundamental question that the, that the world is debating now. And, um, and so when you think, uh, I would add one thing to that because I think it's actually fundamental that as we come up towards uh, 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 etching a price for carbon into the global economic order, and this is where we get cap and trade, this is where we get discussion of the carbon tax, which I won't go into in all detail now. I think you're familiar with these basic principles that uh, there's a fundamental question of equity here because the price of energy is going to increase. And the question is who pays those costs? And I think some of the far-seeing kind of uh, proposals that are now on the table imagine a situation where the price of energy, either through a cap and trade or a carbon tax, begins to be assigned to the um, greenhouse gas weight of certain energy sources, and some of those monies get rebated back to consumers, or particularly lower income consumers who are more uh, who are hit more powerfully than uh, other people with more resources, just to keep that, um, that um, idea in, um, in mind. So um, you've got a, it's why I called this book Carbon Shock. <laughs> it's because I think actually a way to understand uh, climate change is actually to understand it in the sense of the kind of shock that's being delivered to the natural system the natural balancing act that occurs in the atmosphere has its corollary in terms of its impact on the economic order. And uh, in writing this book, I went to all these different places around the world. I talked about, I went up in an airplane and I talked about the sort of battle now between the United States and the European Union over how, how to assign a cost to the um, emissions coming out of airplanes, which is a, a significant contributor of greenhouse gases and has given rise to essentially the first trade war you've never heard of between the European Union and the United States over how to handle those emissions, a battle that's going on right now as we speak, even though most people are not aware of it in this country, over this fundamental question of how you deal with uh, emissions coming out of airplanes. Uh, I went in and out of the food growing areas uh, in, uh, in, um, in the United States to understand the impact it was having on food. Um, discuss the impact on, 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 of course, this area in, in Spain that, that experienced this uh, disaster with the prestige. Went to the Amazon to understand what it means in tropical forest countries. Um, went to different cities to understand how cities begin to maneuver towards kind of low carbon uh, 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 design. And uh, ultimately also tried to understand what these guys doing carbon trading are doing, who some of you are uh, familiar with through the cap and trade system. Anyway, so hopefully this book is kind of like a, a journey through that uh, system. And the, um, the uh, final words and image I'll try to leave you with is there's a, um, there's a fundamental process going on both within this country in terms of the price that businesses now face, the consequence, if you look at actually Every major uh, company is now trying to deal with the consequences of climate change. They're even further ahead than our own Congress is, for the most part. And um, our own uh, uh, United States Department of, of Defense now officially considers climate change to be one of the fundamental uh, 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 national security threats to this nation, partly because of the huge pressure that, the, that is being put on, uh, on the borders of the United States as people are they're dislocated from their land in Mexico and Central America and elsewhere. The European Union has said the same thing because of the same phenomenon happening in Northern Africa. Um, so um, uh, the response to climate change is, is beginning to actually take hold in different places around the world. We're all looking forward to what's going to happen in Paris in uh, 2000 at the end of this year. Um, and um, I think what, what 
what these two maps I'd like you to just remember for a moment is to understand this idea. When it comes to, um, there were two maps that were produced last year. They're very interesting revealing maps. One is by the World Resources Institute, which is a leading think tank in, in Washington. You probably, most of them you've heard of. They actually showed a map of the most water stressed uh, agricultural areas around the world, right? And um, linked to climate change. And they basically have, it's an incredible map because it has these big red splotches uh, across uh, Northern Africa, across Southern Europe, uh, across parts of Southeast Asia, part across a, the kind of center of the Central America uh, isthmus. And splotch there right in the middle is the Midwest, the United States and a nice little etched, little jagged mark in the state of California. At the same level in terms of water threats as these other remote parts of the rest of the world. And there's another, so remember that when you think about uh, where, where, where we are vis-a-vis -vis the world. There's another map that is actually also really interesting. And that map um, was produced by the United States Department of Agriculture. And every two weeks, the United States Department of Agriculture issues a new map it's a fascinating portrait because it's a county by county assessment of the um, indemnities owed to farmers for crop insurance as a result of crop insurance, crop losses. And every single county in America is on these maps. Most counties are in white, which means no indemnities because they don't have any uh, farms. So it's most cities and stuff don't make it onto this map. But what's interesting about the areas that do get, in this case, it's dark brown, uh, dark brown colors on the USDA map. Dark brown colors in the USDA map, same places as the uh, blazing red colors in the World Resources uh, Institute map of water crisis areas. Same places, except this is only the United States. So you have the jagged, you have the heavy, heavy, heavy crop indemnities in where? The Midwest and the Central Valley of California. Why does that matter? That matters, one, because uh, it means that you and I are paying the consequences of that extreme water stress caused significantly by the impacts of climate change. That's our money. And two, that the interesting thing to think, think of this internationally is that all those other farmers in all those other places around the world, they don't have a crop insurance. There's no government that's stepping in in northern Sudan to actually start compensating farmers to stay on the land. So all these farmers that are in those areas of the thing don't get crop insurance. What do they do? They leave the land and they begin migrating and they begin moving and pressures begin and conflicts begin. And there's all sorts of studies about the intensification of conflict when it comes to climate change. So um, I want to leave you with that idea, number one, for two reasons. One is when you think of climate change, think of the stresses on public resources. Two. Uh, think of the growing international pressures and this kind of growing divide between this country and the rest of the world and the tensions that's going to create uh, over time. And, um, and the fundamental process that that suggests. So with that in mind, I know we're kind of running out of time here. I just wanted to, wanted to leave you with some basic ideas. In the book, I go into some detail and I try to tell these stories because actually what happens is that everywhere in the world, these battles are happening. People are becoming aware of these forces and trying to find ways to deal with the consequences of climate change. And I think it's clear every economic study that's been done is that the money we put in now is going to pay far off uh, down the line. And it's going to be far less expensive than if we keep these, these emission trajectories going the way they are today. So with that, I leave you and hold on to this rock. <laughs> Thank you.